Hey, thanks for tuning in to Dan Warner Media. My name is Dan Warner. Today we're going to be breaking down an interview that uh, was done by uh, the great James Lipton on Inside the Actor Studio, and he is interviewing a fantastic actor, uh, Bradley Cooper. So we're going to be watching a little bit of that. We're going to be talking about uh, some of Bradley's interview, some of the things that uh, influenced him and some of the things that he's taken away in his uh, wonderful acting career so far. I think there's, I think he's got uh, a long way to go and a lot of great things to do along the way. And uh, this is going to be wonderful. This is, this was an interview that I really wanted to share with you guys because it, it inspired me and watching it, I've, I've seen it a couple of times and Watching it, it uh, there's a lot of things that ring true and a lot of the things that, that I talk about in my videos and a lot of the tutorials that I have, um, it's funny because I, I watch his interview and I think, oh, he's talking about the same thing I'm talking about um, when it comes to that kind of stuff. The first little clip that I want to show you is, um, you know, he first sits down with James Lipton and he talks about some of his idols and, and uh, how he got his start. Let's, uh, let's take a look. How would you describe your childhood? Uh, blessed. Blessed. Yeah. Are those are the reasons? Um, yeah, those are the reasons. Yeah. As you were growing up, what were your interests? Very early. My mom was great in that way that she introduced my sister and me to uh, drawing and painting and musical instruments. But I also uh, grew up with... Um, you know, these male role models and my father and my uncles and, and sports and uh, what it is to be a man. These students of the Actors Studio Drama School of Pace University are in the precise position you were in for three years. So I'm sure you won't be surprised by some of these questions like this one. When did acting raise its head in your life? Wasn't there a play in the fourth grade? There was. It was Around the World in 80 Days. Uh, and I was Inspector Fix. We did it in the uh, lunchroom auditorium of Rydell Elementary School. And uh, yeah, I definitely didn't even realize at the time, but I was in heaven. I was in heaven. What's Germantown Academy? That is the high school I went to. Right. It was kind of a, a utopia in a way. Um, Why? For, uh, because you had a lot of great teachers. I had a great Latin professor, you know, Mr. Burke, who lived in his classroom. How's your Latin? Awful. Semper ubi, sub ubi. I remember that. Always wear underwear. <laughs> That's about it. Laborare est orare, to work is to pray. Galliae est omnis tu visa in partes tres. Quarum unum unculent belgae. Aliam aquitani. Is that uh, Jay-Z? <laughs> it's a black album. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> it's Julius Goddamn Caesar. <laughs> <laughs> you describe yourself as a huge cinephile. Yeah, uh, because of my father. My father's a little skewed, it was weird, because he was showing me, like, uh, The Elephant Man when I was 12. Um, <laughs> Apocalypse Now, like 13. Uh, Deer Hunter. Did anybody attract your attention particularly among the actors that you saw? Robert De Niro. No question about it. I remember when my parents got cable, and Raging Bull was one of the first movies that came on. And then when Awakenings, when I saw Awakenings, that was it. And he, he was a major, major reason why uh, I wanted to become an actor. What college did you attend? Freshman year, I went to Villanova University, and then I uh, transferred to Georgetown University my sophomore year and graduated from, from Georgetown. What was your major? English. I know that you graduated with honors in 1997 from Georgetown. What grad school did you choose? I chose the Actors Studio MFA program. <laughs> Why did you choose it? My plan was to graduate from Georgetown, spend a summer uh, the next year in Philadelphia, intern at the Schubert Theater, and then try to apply to grad school. But I thought, why don't I just, as a test run, take a shot with this school? Uh, and that's what I did, And because um, I really didn't have any background uh, other than doing um, uh, a, quite a great performance of Around the World in 80 Days in fourth grade. <laughs> but, um, we were very aware of that. I still remember my, my professor, Andrew Scottnicky at Georgetown. Uh, I said to him, uh, hey, do you want to audition with me? He was like, what do you mean? I was like, I've never acted in my life. I said, yeah, yeah, we'll do mass appeal. You get to hit me, you're a priest, you're a drunk. So he and I took a train from D.C. 
to, uh, to New York. I still remember it. Uh, unbelievable. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, crazy. Who auditioned? <laughs> <laughs> and walked out and then couldn't see anything. It was all dark. And then this figure started to descend. <laughs> 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 I remember it like it was yesterday. So do I. I really do. I remember it. We, we, I, we, did, the, we did the scene, and then he descended again. <laughs> and I, I remember what you said. You said, are you prepared to spend the next three years of your life dedicated to this program? And I said, yeah. And then I, and then that was it. That was all he said. And then for the next, uh, until I found out that I got in, we deconstructed that sentence, Andrew and I. <laughs> what do you think that meant? That meant I'm in, right? Okay. He said, am I prepared? Meaning, like, he doesn't think I am prepared, so I'm not in. Right, right. And then we came back, we took the train back, and there was like a party, actually, in my apartment, because everybody, my friends were so excited that I, they were like, hey, how'd it go? We're like, oh, yeah, it was great. The guy, no, the guy said. And then we would do our impersonation of you. <laughs> Want to know what it meant? Yeah. I never said it unless the person was that good. Who was your basic technique teacher? <sighs> May I introduce to all of you Elizabeth Kemp. What were her classes like? I'm sorry. Oh. I'm a really loud crier too. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not like a. I'm not like. I'm not like a sobber. I'm like a. It's very. It's ugly. So I apologize. I can't talk with tears. It's going to be like a hyperventilating. Um, I, I, I was thinking about this today, <clears throat> and the thing that I wanted to say was, uh, <sighs> that <clears throat> I was never able to relax in my life before her. This is not an ordinary school, as you may have detected. We don't all sit around the halls crying all the time, but... <laughs> Actually, yeah. <laughs> In our class, there was a good deal of that. <laughs> Tell us what it was like to teach this guy. There was something that had happened to me many years prior to that, and I had learned a great lesson from a mentor, uh, Aliyah Kazan, who had said, you know, I only want to work with people who give. Um, everything they have to give and make it their work the most important thing to them in their life. And uh, that was what struck me about Bradley, that every day he was there, he gave more than I think he thought even humanly possible to give. And um, it wouldn't stop. It was always leaving a piece of himself right there in the room every day and not looking back. There was a real uh, family feeling. I mean, it was a very private, a sacred place that we had at that room. Sacred place. Uh, and so special. And being away from it, being in the world now, uh, and being lucky enough to work as an actor, having wonderful experience, no question about it, uh, the most sacred experience I've ever had was in that room. No question about it. So thank you. I just have to mention Andreas Menelikakis as well. I learned how to deconstruct a script from this man right here. Both of these people had given me the tools that I use in every job, uh, and I, I really did not have a clue how to uh, break down a script before I had his class. Because she was, it was all about opening up an expression, which is essential, and he was all about, okay, where are you gonna, where are you gonna implement that in, in, in the world of the story that you're telling? What did you do for your master's degree thesis for us in the repertory season? I played the Elephant Man. Bradley as the Elephant Man. 
wound up on the cover of our catalog for the Active Studio Drama School. He oh, became right. one of our symbols. One of the many unique features of our master's degree program is what the students call the seminar and what the public calls inside the actor's studio. In short, this. You don't have to take my word for it because a picture is worth a thousand words. Hey, Mr. Penn. Uh, my name is Bradley Cooper. I'm a second year actor. My question is regarding Hurley Burley. What was it like to revisit a character, Eddie, after a 10 year hiatus? Did you have new discoveries? Yeah, it was, a, it was the first time that I'd done a film of something that I had done a play right. of. It took me a whole number of films before I was comfortable with allowing myself to be seen through my films. It took a long time for that to happen. That didn't happen right away. How you doing, Mr. De Niro? My name is Bradley Cooper. Uh, my question is regarding awakenings. You talked about your research and how you, uh, you interviewed a lot of patients, people who had the different yeah. diseases. And so there was one um, mannerism that you had during the interview process when they were asking you when you wanted to go outside the building, go for a walk. And you did, went like this with your finger and you sort of made up for it by rubbing your eyebrow. Right. And I was wondering, is that something that you would saw people do, sort of try to make up for their tics, or was that something that happened in the moment? That's a good question. Okay, so you see that uh, Robert De Niro was clearly one of his uh, one of his idols and, and somebody who uh, evoked emotion in him and uh, made him want to be an actor. And then later you see where he's talking about his classes and his school and where he went to school. And it just, you saw how emotional he gets. And it really speaks to... Uh, what a great acting class will do for you. And, and along your journey, how, how much it means to you. And, and here's the interesting thing about uh, Bradley and, and his journey. And that is that because he was so dedicated and had such a, a, a passion for acting and, it, you know, dove in headfirst into his classes and all that, it's now emotional for him to talk about it. And it's emotional for him to talk about his teachers. And he sees where he was and where he is now. And he has those people to thank. That is something that a great class will do for you. Um, you are going to meet people along the way. You're going to meet teachers. You're going to meet people that you'll know forever and ever and ever. And they will be the nearest, dearest uh, people to you uh, that you can possibly imagine. They're, they will become part of your family and they're there to help you and they're there to lift you up and they're there to support you. And uh, yeah, it's interesting how emotional he gets. <laughs> um, but uh, here's some more really great stuff. Watch this. Since you were there from the beginning of Alias. Yes. Did you have any input in the creation of the character of Will Tippin? That experience was more about the, the, the family nature of it. What do you mean by the family nature? Uh, um, Jennifer Garner and Victor Garner. Becoming part of an real ensemble. Family. Yeah, a real I'm ensemble. Talking. All of us were sort of uprooted and planted in Los Angeles, and all we had to fend for ourselves was each other in, in that first year. So it was a really wonderful experience in terms of the ensemble, as you say. When Stanley Donovan was on our stage, I asked him, how do you direct someone like Audrey Hepburn? without falling in love with her. Mm. And he said, you don't, you fall in love. Uh, I would imagine that working with Jennifer Garner presents that same dilemma. Absolutely. In The Elephant Man in our school and uh, on Alias, on television, Bradley was what the audience thinks of as a dramatic actor. Then along came a movie called Wedding Crashers. <laughs> <laughs> And a brand new Bradley Cooper was born. <laughs> or was it a brand new Bradley? Um, it's a crazy thing about this business. On Alias, I played the nicest guy in the world. Um, and I would try to audition for movies after that. And they, the, the, the feedback was often, uh, oh, Brad Bradley's such a nice guy. <laughs> such a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't really see him in that part. And, uh, and that was always it. And then after Wedding Crashers, it was Bradley, yeah, he's an asshole, right? <laughs> Here is Sack, the asshole, <laughs> at his most devious and vile. Hello. Trapster, it's Sack. Sack, master. How was the wedding? No, it was boring, you know. But the bachelor party, of course, rocked. We got Heidi a couple of those 
and sluts from the environmental group. You remember them? No way. Did you tab that again? Once in my place, then once back in the cab. Damn, sluts. Uh, how's Claire? Still trying to uh, figure out what she's doing with her life? Claire, she's, you know, whatever. I don't know, she's saving the world, one maladjusted kid at a time, but that'll all change when we're married, because I want a wife, I don't want a fucking martyr, right? I hear that, my friend. Hey, man, listen, I, I, uh, I, uh, I got Do you remember that private detective we used to set up that fucking Shearson Lehman fuck? The big sleazy, Tommy Gufano, he's a WAP genius. Yes, I need you to get some dirt on these two guys, John and Jeremy Ryan, they're brothers from New Hampshire. They got some sort of NPO called Holy Shirts and Pants. I will check into them. Excellent, bro. You the man. Take it easy. I'd like to ask you about some of that cast. Vince Vaughn. Oh, man. He is a force of nature, that guy. Uh, taught me so much. You talk about a guy who gives it all, and then, and he would also just be so free to fail. And then you have Owen, <laughs> who, who is just the perfect counterpart to him, who um, is, in my mind, incapable of, of saying anything inauthentic. And I got to watch Christopher Walken do uh, his work in it, which was great. Owen Wilson and Chris Walken both have very distinctive sounds. Yeah, no, absolutely. What's Owen's sound like? Owen's like, uh, Claire's mom made me feel her hooter. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I met Christopher Walken was in the makeup chair, and, and he was talking, oh, one thing he told me was like, your hair is like, what do you have to do to maintain, to maintain your hair is keep rubbing it, rubbing it all the time. <laughs> Yeah, fingers in your hands, great, great. Bradley, Bradley, great. Okay, so we see Bradley also talking about how in the beginning of his career, he was sort of uh, typecast as a nice guy, a good guy, you know, he's a really good looking guy and he was always very nice in all of his roles. And then uh, Wedding Crashers came along and uh, he was a not so nice guy in there, a little smarmy, uh, a little, uh, a bit of a, an ass bag. And so uh, it's interesting in the curvature of your career and the trajectory of your career that you can prod along as a, a certain type of person. And you know, a lot of actors think, oh gosh, I'm gonna get typecast as this, typecast as that. And I think everyone thinks that from time to time. You know, they think, uh, gosh, I'm gonna be typecast. And so, um, I will tell you, being typecast as something is, is not necessarily a bad thing. There are people who have made their careers on being typecast. Listen, I've played a uh, good guy, uh, law enforcement, uh, mostly cops, lawyers, coaches, dads, you know, all good guys for a long time. I love to play a bad guy. I love it. I would do it all the time. But, um, but I also uh, know that it's it's nice to be typecast because it's nice to continue to get those roles. And so I don't think you should ever worry about being typecast, but it's interesting how, uh, you know, he started to, you know, he played, did one movie where he was a, a bad guy, a little smarmy, and then the offers kept coming in. And it's really great to see a guy who was a nice guy, good looking guy, who can also play a bad guy. Because to me, it seems like if you are, the better looking you are and the nicer looking guy and the, like the nice guy, if you play a bad guy against type, against what you look like, it makes you much more evil and much more uh, horrible. Um, so uh, don't ever worry about, uh, about being typecast or, or any of that other stuff. Here's another great clip, watch this. In April of 2006, I had the distinct pleasure of attending the Broadway opening night of a play called Three Days of Rain. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Who was in it? Julia Roberts, uh, Paul Rudd, and myself. Woof. I thought, if I don't succeed in this play, I'm probably going to give up acting. I really did think that. Um, and I was very serious about it because the rehearsal process was a huge struggle for me. Uh, I, was, I wasn't sleeping and I, I really thought I was going to get fired every day and I did not have fun at all until the first preview when I first walked out stage on stage and I thought, I said, uh, hey, okay, now it's me, my turn and I started talking and I thought, okay, this feels right. This feels like grad school because I hadn't been on stage since uh, The Elephant Man. 
And I thought, okay. And then, and then I just started to, to really love it. And it was wonderful, uh, wonder, wonderful, Light, life changing. Julie Roberts did a very brave and a very rare thing, leaving the protection and safety of film with an editor and so forth for the naked risk of theater. I thought she carried it off splendidly. Oh. It was wonderful. I remember so many moments on stage with Julia, um, uh, very connected to the other actors. Okay, so uh, another great clip. And, and listen, you, you know, you see the impressions that he does of uh, Owen Wilson and, and uh, Christopher Walken. He is a wildly talented guy. Um, but here's another interesting thing that you just saw, and that is a true actor will go back to their roots. And so, you know, he's having a successful film career, which, you know, for most actors, that's really uh, the best you can hope for. Now, I know a lot of actors are doing a lot of TV now, but, you know, back in the day, actors just wanted to do films. They wanted to be film actors. And so he had that going for him. And, and like other great actors, uh, so many great actors, too many to name, they go back to their roots in the theater. And so he went back and did that play with Julia Roberts. And, and so there's no truer art form as an actor than to do a play on a stage because you are there, it's raw. You are, you know, uh, naked as it were. You know, you're just there, the audience is there and you don't get take one and take two. You've got to do it there. You've got to have your lines down. You've got to have your emotions. You've got to have your choices. You've got to have all those things. And uh, if, I, if I can stress one thing, it is, uh, you know, go do a play. Go find a play that you like, you know, uh, audition for plays, because that is going to give you amazing, amazing training. And I don't use the word amazing often, but it will give you amazing training. Uh, it's just like a, a comedian who wants to do stand-up. You know, stand-up is a very raw form of entertainment, uh, as is the theater. And so uh, it, it's, it's really something that you should, that you should do. Um, here's, uh, here's one more clip. I want to ask you about a remarkable movie called Limitless. Who is Eddie Mora? Eddie Mora is a down-and-out writer in New York. He doesn't have a dime, and uh, his girlfriend just broke up with him. And he's basically resigned to the fact that his dreams are not going to come true. He finds a drug. That's right. He meets on the street his ex-wife's brother, who he used to do a lot of drugs with, who used to be a dealer. And this guy, Vernon, uh, talks about this new drug. He asks him, how's the book going? Well, I haven't written anything. And, and uh, he says, well, I got this thing that's great. It's FDA approved. It's just this sort of mind enhancer. It's fantastic. But I'm telling you, it's going to help with your thing. So I just sort of take it, don't even think about it. And then walking home, I just, uh, f pop it in my mouth, not even thinking. And then, so the movie begins. Yeah. The film deals with two very complex subjects, psychogenic drugs. Yeah. And Wall Street dealings at the highest and most mysterious level. Mm. Knowing firsthand from your days in this school, how thorough your preparation is, did this role require any research? One thing I do for, I've done for almost every movie I've done is work with Elizabeth. I'll send her the script beforehand and then uh, we'll spend however long it takes uh, to go through it. Eddie Mora is a massive role. You're in all but one or two scenes of the yeah. film. Eddie's voice narrates the movie. Right. Which means quite simply that everything in it is seen from his point of view. Did you take that into account in preparing and playing the role? In as much as I take into account the script as the basic holy grail of the approach to the work. Is it the yeah. holy grail? Yeah. Sometimes I've movie scripts are not. For me, uh, they're where the story is, so you have to find the story. The story is the holy grail. As we saw on the screen here, you and De Niro met when he was in that chair. If at that point in your life, a genie had popped out of a bottle and whispered in your ear that someday you would be co-starring with De Niro, what would your reaction have been? God, I hope so. You'd have believed it. You were ready to believe it? Yeah, I hope so, yeah. I mean, but it is an astonishing oh, journey. Oh, no, it's, it's uh, Jim, uh, it's astonishing that I'm here talking to you, you know. It's, Not to me it isn't. Yeah. I was your dean. <laughs> <laughs> you said that De Niro is one of the reasons I became an actor. We were all anxious as shooting neared uh, with him. You know what? I wasn't. He's probably uh, one of the, the, the 
in this business that I've met, the people that, I, that I've become uh, most fond of, I just, uh, he's such an incredible man. It's, you know. So when I actually met him and he wound up being so, uh, so sensitive and, and open and wonderful guy, it, it was easy. I still remember the table read in Philadelphia of, this, of the script. I'm acting my balls off doing the thing. And then I remember he was like, hey, what's And I was like, oh, so what's up? And then he was saying his line, <laughs> but I was too busy acting <laughs> that I didn't realize he was actually saying the script. Uh, <laughs> and that, that, that's how real he is. I mean, I, in my experience with him was I, I just loved every day. He shot for two weeks, and it was the, by far the easiest time I've ever had Jim acting, ever. I didn't have to do a thing working with him. I really didn't. I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding. I just, it was just effortless. It was effortless to work with him. Here, by way of demonstration, are two actors' studio members facing off in one of many memorable scenes in Limitless. What do you know about Hank Atwood? Atwood, um, he's an iconoclast. Um, I owns about half of Colorado. So this is prepared, Eddie? <sighs> Is this Atwood 101? And doesn't everybody know about Atwood? Where was he two years ago? Nowhere. Two years ago, he wasn't even on Forbes' radar. That was a great leap forward, right? I'm baffled by this guy. Comes out of nowhere so fucking strong. Has me on the run before I can even get to anybody in his camp. Beats me out of two properties, invest in countries with no oil, places I'd never go near without selling. Sex stuff has his money. Always picks green technologies, invest in them. This is Eddie kicking the drug, so he's lost his edge. Yes, yeah. He's just come off uh, uh, what he thinks may have been three days uh, on it, and. Uh, and he's got to go to this meeting, and he's completely unprepared. Walk our students through your process. Do you ever create a backstory for your character? Uh, it, I mean, it's, uh, it's essential. You have to know where you're coming from. How much do you leave open for accident and inspiration? If I pray for it. <laughs> you do? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. God, I hope. I mean, that's what all the preparation's for. I remember Christopher Walken during a scene with Owen Wilson. Um, I was watching him, it was unbelievable, and he was talking to him, and in, in the middle of the scene, he would tell him, yeah, and was just, pa! And like, because <laughs> he was getting himself, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's what he was doing. <laughs> I don't know what Bob was doing to me at one point, but when I meet him for the first time, this was crazy. And um, I'm describing my, what I was able to do. And it was a very, Leslie Dixon wrote a wonderful script, and there was a paragraph, you know, a half a page of dialogue of where I'm explaining him. And he's sitting there like this. I go through the thing, and then he goes, go on. And I thought, go on? The scene's over. And he wanted me to keep wooing him with my knowledge. So I started to make up stuff. My dad uh, uh, was a stockbroker. I started to make up stuff that I remembered that he had done, uh, talking about, my, and basically telling the story of my father, talking about his background. I was like, well, you remember so-and-so gave you your first job and the thing, and he, and Bob was like, I do, I do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was great, you know, the always thing, always say yes and, you know. Yes, it, yes. He was like, yeah, I do, yeah. I was like, you know, when you were in Linden's, and he said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, then I, and then I, so I talked for, you know, two minutes, and then he went, go on. I'm not kidding, this was for about 10 minutes. Whoa. To work with Bob was a you know, lifelong dream. Okay, so ending on De Niro again. Um, what an amazing story. How, you know, really great actors are. Uh, and again, this is something that I've said in a, a number of my videos. Being a real person in a real place, having a real experience. There at a table read, Robert De Niro is reading the lines from the script and Bradley Cooper thinks he's just talking to him. He's got the script, they both have the script, but De Niro is he's so good 
that he leans over and he's, re, you know, reciting the lines and Bradley thinks, oh, he's talking to me. What, what did you say? And then it turns out, oh, he's just reading the script. That is, that to me was just one of the most amazing stories. Um, and just a, a tribute to how being present and being in the moment is, uh, is so vital. And it's really the key to uh, a, a, an amazing performance, an amazing career, an amazing actor. Um, so, gosh, this was just such a wonderful, I, I'm going to probably do more of these. Leave a questions or comments. If you liked this, if you liked this format where you see, you know, somebody talking about acting and me, to, uh, you know, breaking it down for you, leave a comment uh, in, the, in the comment section below. If you like this video, uh, hit the like button. Um, this was just such a treat for me to do. Uh, and uh, thanks for watching. Uh, if you've not subscribed to my channel yet, every week, man, I'm here. I'm always here. So, uh, listen, uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week on another, ep <laughs> another episode of uh, Hogan's Heroes. Didn't see that coming, did you? I don't know why I always do the 70s, 70s and 80s, I think 70s TV shows, Hogan's Heroes, yeah. Hogan's Heroes. Hogan! I see nothing, I see nothing.